Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. We're now moving on to Chapter 7, Species Interactions, Ecological Succession, and Population Control. Once again, I'll break the lecture down into two parts. There's about 47 slides. Uh, so again, it'll be about uh, two, two lectures, about, about 20 minutes each. All right, so here we go. First things first, core case study, the southern sea otter, a species in recovery. Uh, they're talking about this uh, giant sea otter, which live in giant kelp forests on the Pacific coast or just off the Pacific coast. Uh, these sea otters were almost hunted to extinction in the early uh, by the early 1900s, but there is a bit of a of a positive to this. Uh, since the uh, creature, the uh, sea otter, was uh, listed as endangered in 1977, we have seen a partial recovery. Reasons we care about sea otters: their keystone species, ethics, and, and of course tourism dollars. Uh, it's kind of fun to uh, kind of swim around and uh, see these things. Uh, I've had the opportunity to actually uh, snorkel in one of these giant kelp forests, uh, Catalina Island, which is just off the coast of, of Los Angeles in Southern California. I've been there a few times and I've actually uh, uh, snorkeled above one of these giant kelp forests and they really are spectacular. Uh, Science Focus 7.1 actually talks about the threats to these kelp forests. Uh, giant kelp anchor to the ocean floor and grow towards the surface. That's what we're talking about. Again, that picture I just showed you. Uh, they're fast growing, they're resistant to storm and wave damage, and they support many marine plants and animals. Uh, for instance, the sea otter and, for instance, the sea urchins. Uh, sea urchins prey on the kelp plants, but the southern sea otter preys on the sea urchins. Uh, so obviously, uh, if you get rid of these beautiful kelp forests, and I'll tell you what, uh, snorkeling over the top of them, seeing all the different species of fish swim through them, uh, it really is pretty cool. Hopefully, you'll have a chance one day in your life to actually actually get to see some of them. Uh, yeah, but obviously, the ecosystem continues to be threatened by pollutants and and, and and, and climate change. Again, talking about how all these things interact. You got you got kelp, you got sea urchins, you got uh, sea otters, uh, all of these species, all of these uh, organisms interact. And that's what this chapter is talking about. So how do species interact? Well, they're going to interact in five ways that we're going to talk about in this, in this chapter. Uh, and again, we're going to talk about all of these five ways in more detail. But five types of species interactions uh, affect resource use and species population size in an ecosystem. And those five are competition, predation, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. Okay, and again, we're going to talk about all five of these in more detail. So the first is competition for resources or competition. Competition is the most common interaction among species. There are two types of competition. The first basic interspecific competition. This is when the competition is between two different species that use the same limited resources. So think about the African safari. You have the uh, hyena, you have the lion. Both of them want to eat zebra. Both of them are in competition. They're interspecific competition between the two of them for the same resource, that zebra uh, that they are going to prey on. Okay, so you think about that uh, when you think of the interspecific competition. The other type of com competition is called resource partitioning competition. And this occurs when different species evolve specialized traits that allow them to share the same resources. So for instance, species may use only part of a resource. They might use it at a different time than another species, or they may use it in a different way. And this is called resource partitioning. Think about it, partition. What do you do? You kind of give groups, right? Partition things out, give certain, uh, uh, certain things to certain people, partition. That's the same thing that's happening here in this resource partitioning. So think about the warbler. The warbler is a, it's a bird. And you'll notice uh, these different types of warblers here. And what we're showing you is uh, an evergreen tree. And you'll notice there are evergreen tree is green and there are some yellow parts of each tree. What this is telling us is that each of these warblers have evolved that they only look for resources or look for their prey in a specific part of the tree. So for instance, the Blackburnian warbler will hunt for its insects on the outer 
stretches of the tree, maybe up near the top, while the black-throated green warbler is going to kind of hunt for its prey kind of in the middle of the tree. The Cape May warbler just going to hunt at the top of the tree. You'll notice the yellow rumped warbler at the end there only going to hunt for insects at the bottom of the tree. This is resource partitioning. So all five of these warblers have evolved to prey or to look for insects in a different part of the tree. And this way, they all can survive in the same tree by sharing the resources, by using, again, looking at four resources in a different part of the tree, allowing them to share all the resources in the tree. Uh, that is resource partitioning. Another example are, uh, are beaks uh, of, this, uh, of these uh, finches, okay? You'll notice on the left side, you have, uh, so once we had an unknown finch ancestor, okay, and then over time, evolution created on the left side, finches that eat fruit and seeds, and on the right side, uh, finches that eat uh, insects and nectar and you'll notice their beaks have evolved differently right look at the uh look at the one up here the kawaii akaloaya all right look at that beak how small it is obviously or how long it is obviously they're looking for nectar right they're getting into that into that tree or into that flower to, to get nectar or maybe or maybe looking into that tree to get ants or something in the tree right while the greater koa koa finch there all right, it's a fruit and seed eater, kind of has more of a smaller beak, but maybe he's more powerful, right, to like break seeds or something like that. So again, resource partitioning, evolution, allowing these creatures to compete for resources, but obviously by making them evolve different traits, uh, they end up competing for different resources, and this allows uh, all these different types of finches uh, to be to 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 uh, survive and to flourish uh, in whatever ecosystem they happen to be in. All right, next type of interaction is, interaction is called predation. All right, predation you probably all know about. This is when a predator feeds directly on or all or part of a member of another species, which we call the prey species. Uh, predation has a strong effect on population size and other factors in an ecosystem. And there are many methods of predation, walk, swim, fly, camouflage, chemical warfare, etc., that uh, creatures, that organisms have evolved over time uh, to help them uh, to help them interact in this in this predation sort of way. Prey species have also evolved differently to avoid the predator. So again, some species have evolved the camouflage, or some species of prey use chemical warfare to hold off. Uh, uh, predators, right? Warning coloration, usually very bright colors in nature uh, are, are a way that uh, that prey species will kind of warn off because if you see bright colors, usually it's poisonous. Mimicry or, or other behavioral strategies uh, that prey species have used uh, to evolve in a way to uh, avoid predator. So here's your predator-prey relationship. Again, the, this is the basic one here. You got a, a bear. A bear eats the fish. The bear is the predator. The fish is the prey. Uh, and that's pretty much uh, the, the, the uh, relationship those two those two creatures have ha, have with one another uh, and again this is just some other ways that um, that this prey predator relationship has evolved uh, you'll notice again that wandering leaf insect it has camouflaged itself to look like a look 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 like a leaf right uh, the monarch butterfly actually tastes horrible so when other uh, organisms see those beautiful colors they're like oh I don't want to prey on that uh, so that's how the uh, the uh, the monarch has evolved uh, the poison dart frog again it has evolved to kill prey by using chemical warfare it, it has it's poisonous um, so uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so again just some other uh, types of prey predator prey relationships uh, that you guys can kind of look out here and again just know just know a couple of them uh, and just understand what they are. Coevolution, okay, is what we've been talking about here, uh, and predation plays a role in natural selection. Animals with better defenses against predation tend to leave more offspring. So that's what coevolution means. It means predators and prey kind of evolving together, okay? And again, as the predator evolves, uh, something that helps it uh, 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 eat, eat more prey, the prey creature will evolve something to allow it to be 
protected by the predator. And then the predator will have to evolve something to allow it to get to the prey more. And then the prey will evolve something uh, that it, that it uh, again, protects it from the predator, et cetera, et cetera. This is called co-evolution, all right? When predator and prey evolving together, all right, to try to basically, the predator wants to eat the prey, the prey doesn't want to get eaten, and they evolve together uh, over time. Changes in the gene pool of one species can cause changes in the gene pool of another. Example, uh, baths, uh, baths and bats and moths, okay? Um, so uh, just again, just some examples uh, of this co-evolution. All right, the next uh, three we'll talk about, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. So parasitism uh, is when one species, a parasite, lives on another organism, all right? The parasite will harm, but rarely kill the host. And some examples of parasitism are tapeworms, sea lampreys, fleas, and ticks, okay? Uh, so for instance, uh, here is uh, some kind of, believe this is a sea lamprey. This is a kind of a blood sucking organism that has attached itself uh, to this trout, uh, to this uh, this North American trout here. And again, the parasite uh, is sucking the blood off of this off of this uh, fish. Uh, most likely, uh, it will not kill the fish, but it's obviously a parasit is, uh, parasitism here. It is obviously a parasite. It is using uh, the fish's resources for itself. Mutualism is when an interaction benefits both species. So parasitism is when the interaction just just benefits the one species, the parasite. In mutualism, think about mutual, okay? The interaction benefits both species. So for instance, uh, it could be a nutrition and some kind of protective uh, relationship, all right? But what's very important is that it's not a cooperation, okay? These creatures are not cooperating in mutualism. It is a mutual exploitation of one another, okay? So very important. A lot of folks think mutualism, oh, the creatures are, 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 are cooperating. They're not. They're mutually exploiting each other, okay? But it, it, the difference between that and parasitism is that you, in the parasitism, you only have one creature, the parasite. In mutualism, you have two creatures, each of them exploiting each other. So an example here is the clownfish uh, living with the sea anemones. All right, uh, the clownfish gain protection and feed on waste matter left by the anemone's meals, while the clownfish will protect the sea anemone from some predators and parasites. They're not necessarily cooperating. They're just both using each other's resources. They're both exploiting each other's resources, both of them together, mutual exploitation. All right. Uh, so here is, again, an, an example. You have these birds living on this, uh, this type of deer here. Um, and the birds are basically eating the ticks off of the deer, okay? So uh, the tick, the deer uses the birds to, to get rid of its ticks. The birds use the deer as a way for food to get ticks. Again, they're not cooperating, but they're both exploiting each other's uh, resources or what each other's do. Again, the bird exploiting the resources of the ticks on the deer, obviously, and the deer uh, exploiting the, the bird's resource of getting the ticks off of it. So again, that's your, that's your example of mutualism. Commensalism is when uh, something benefits one species and has little effect on the other. Uh, so epiphytes are air plants that attach themselves to trees. Again, the epiphyte, um, you know, going to be good for the tree, going to be good for itself. Okay, it benefits it itself. Well, it doesn't really do anything to the tree. So again, the difference between this and parasitism is parasitism is going to hurt the other creature that the parasite is on. May not kill it, but it's still going to harm it. In 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 this uh, commensalism, it's not going to harm it. So again, the epiphyte attaches itself to the trees. It it gets its nutrients from the from the from the air. It's living on the tree. It doesn't harm the tree. It's not getting its nutrients from the tree. It just happens to be attaching itself to the tree. Same things with birds nesting in trees, right? The bird using the tree to nest. It's not necessarily uh, hurting the tree in, in any way. Uh, it just uses the tree, so it, it benefits itself, and it has absolutely no effect on the tree. That is your commensalism, all right? And again, this is just an example. There's an, uh, one of those epiphytes. Again, uh, this these. Uh, uh, these plants that kind of hang in the air or live off the air, get their nutrients through the air. They live on other trees, but again, they're not gaining their nutrients from other trees. They're just kind of living there. Okay, uh, so again, it, it helps them. It doesn't harm the other, other, uh, the other organism. That is your commensalism.
All right. So how do communities and ecosystems re respond to changing environmental conditions? All right. So this is where we're going to start talking about now ecological succession. So how do these communities and ecosystems respond when environmental conditions uh, change? So. Uh, ecological succession is the normally gradual change in structure and species composition in a given system. There are two types, primary and secondary. Primary ecological succession involves gradual establishment of communities in lifeless areas. Need to build up fertile soil or, 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 or aquatic sediments to support plant community. Pioneer species such as lichens or mosses will come in first. Okay, so that's going to be uh, your primary ecological succession. So what's an example of this? A volcanic eruption. All right, volcanic eruption, you have lava comes down a mountain, completely destroys everything in its sight, right? Trees burns down, homes, grasslands, whatever. You have this whole thing of, of lava, the lava cools, all right? And then eventually over time, all right, it's lifeless. But over time now, uh, with, with when we talk about erosion and weathering, right, that 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 lava begins to begins to erode a little bit. It begins to come become fertile soil. Then pioneer species such as lichens or mosses come in, uh, start breaking it down even more, turning it into soil. That then seeds can come land on it, and you start to grow some 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 plants. Same thing in an aquatic sediment that can happen under the water. Again, you need that soil to come in first to support the plant community. So uh, here's just uh, here's just again a visual of your uh, primary uh, uh, succession here. Exposed rocks again, or that lava field. All right, lichens and mosses come in next. Begin to break it up, weather, turn it into soil. Then you get uh, small herbs and shrubs. Then you get some bigger uh, shrubs called a heath mat, and then obviously trees begin to to grow in it. And then you begin to get your organisms, your other creatures coming on in uh, and, and, and beginning to live in that area once again, which again was lifeless, but through that primary succession uh, ended up uh, having life or having uh, some kind of ecosystem once again. Uh, and again, this is just the same thing for, uh, for an aquatic system. All right, so you have a lake here, nutrients flow into the lake, soil leaves and, and decaying matters, matters sink to the bottom. All right, and eventually uh, that lake fills up. Okay, and you have this nice sediment, a uh, fertile sediment that then uh, uh, plants and grasses and, and other things can end up growing on them. All right. Secondary ecological succession involves a series of terrestrial communities or ecosystems that develop in places with soil or sediment. Okay. So here the examples would be abandoned farmland, maybe burned or cut forest, or maybe some flooded land. So in primary succession, you, you start with no soil. Nothing again, either just exposed rock or again, just that lava or that lava field. There's nothing there. Secondary ecological succession, you'll start with soil. So, for instance, uh, 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 an area of forest burns down, uh, you're not left with just bare rock, you're left with or it's soil, you're left with ash, right? You're left with stuff that uh, can begin to, right off the bat, uh, get seeds to land and, and support plant growth uh, and, and, and things like that. So that's your secondary ecological succession. Uh, factors that affect the rate uh, facilitation of area by one species for another, uh, inhibition hinders growth, okay? So these are things that would affect the rate uh, or how fast that secondary ecological succession will take. And again, just uh, another visual. Again, you don't see the bare rocks, right? You don't see the bare rocks first. That's the difference between uh, primary and secondary ecological succession. Here in secondary, you have these weeds, uh, then grasses begin to grow, shrubs, and then obviously you get your forest uh, uh, to eventually grow as well uh, as you go through time, okay? So those are, again, two types of ecological successions, your primary and your secondary. Uh, just understand, uh, just make sure you understand the difference between the two. Is there a balance of nature? Well, the traditional view says ecological succession provides, uh, proceeds to stable climax communities, okay? So that's what happens, all right? So the traditional view uh, was that ecological succession continues until you get to that stable climax community, maybe that forest, all right? And the equilibrium is called a balance of nature. However, our current view is changing, all right? That was the traditional view of ecological succession, that you have that succession, it, it, it continues until you get to this stable climax community like a deciduous forest, okay? 
The current view, though, that is, is that succession leads to a more complex, diverse, and resilient ecosystem uh, can withstand changes, if not too large or too sudden. So that's the current view. So it's not that we necessarily get to this stable community. The current view is that we get to this more complex, diverse, and resilient ecosystem, but it's not necessarily stable. That's the key, the old school versus the new school view of ecological succession. Old school view was that we got to this stability. New school view is that we get to a better, a more diverse and a more resilient ecosystem. OK, but it's not necessarily OK, totally stable. Everything is always in flux. And we're learning that because we're learning that everything in the earth, as you've been learning throughout this course, is all interconnected. So nothing is really totally stable. All right. And again, that's the current view of ecological succession. Living systems are sustained through constant change. So inertia is the ability of a living system to survive moderate disturbances. Resilience is the ability of a living system to be restored through secondary succession after a moderate disturbance. So again, that's that's your resiliency. So for instance, a desert environment, we talked about desert bio in the past, uh, the past unit or two units ago, chapter five. Desert biomes uh, have a hard time dealing with disturbances. That's because they're not as resilient, right? We talked about it because they don't have a lot of water. Uh, they don't have a fast growing season. So if you if you if you if you disturb a desert, okay, uh, secondary succession will you know you'll it'll get restored, but it's it's going to be harder. There, it's not as resilient uh, to moderate disturbances as let's say maybe a a, 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 a tropical rainforest might. Be, okay, where you have a lot of activity, a lot of uh, a lot of rain, and a lot of uh, a lot of sunlight, a lot of warm temperatures. So maybe if you get a little bit of disturbance in that tropical rainforest, it's a little bit more more resilient than let's say a desert, and therefore it will be able to rest be restored quicker uh, through that secondary succession. All right. So again, just understand what the terms inertia and resilience mean, and understand that systems with uh, with not as much resiliency are going to not be able to handle moderate disturbances as well as systems that uh, that are going to be resilient and again being restored through that secondary succession. Okay, so that's going to end uh, part one of my uh, lecture on chapter seven. We'll come back and do part two, starting with what limits the growth of populations, but that coming next. So I will see you then.